Um, yes. Okay. So hello, everyone. Um, this is the Asian Cart Canada webinar series. Uh, this is the webinar Confused with CARP, uh, ID and reporting features for Asian CARP. And we are joined by Brooke Schreier. Hi, everybody. Brooke is the Aquatic Invasive Species Outreach Liaison with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. She works for the Invading Species Awareness Program, uh, which handles Asian carp reports, uh, development of Asian carp resources, outreach for boaters and waterfowl hunters, as well as doing the Invading Species Hotline and EdMaps Ontario. So Brooke's going to take you through um, some basic Asian carp information, as well as the most confused with uh, species that gets reported as Asian carp. Uh, so we chose these species because those are the ones that most commonly get reported to the invading species hotline as Asian carp. So we really wanted to make sure that uh, those species get highlighted and hopefully the public kind of understands which species are which and then how to report any species that they might not be sure of or think are Asian carp. So I'll hand it over to Brooke to, uh, to take over now. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks for joining today, everybody. So as Lauren said, I am going to run through um, Confused with carp, so some of the native species that may be identified or may be misidentified as Asian carp uh, by anglers, recreational boaters, people walking along waterways, what have you. So as she said, I, I am the Aquatic Invasive Species Outreach Liaison with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and their Breeding Species Awareness Program. Trying to change the slide here. No. Sorry guys, one sec. All right, so table of contents for this, uh, for this webinar. So first I'm going to start off with what is the Invading Species Awareness Program? Uh, next we're going to move into a few definitions. Then we are going to look at a little bit, a brief background on the invasion of Asian carp. And then we're going to do a little bit of basic Asian carp identification. And then we're going to focus most of the presentation on Asian carp lookalikes. And then finally there will be a few slides on how you can report Asian carp. Before I begin, I just wanted to say a special thank you to the Invasive Species Center for setting this up. More specifically, Lauren Snelly, who is the Asian Carp Project Coordinator, who you just uh, heard speaking. And then finally, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, for really spearheading this whole program. And you know, without their support, this would not be happening today. So who is ISAP? Uh, it's a joint education awareness partnership between the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestries, which was established in 1992. It was originally established due to the invasion of zebra mussels into Ontario, and it has since expanded into all invasive species. So its primary focus is on education and outreach for aquatic and terrestrial invasive invertebrates, fish, and plants in Ontario. It also focuses on key pathways from invasive species, introductions, and or spread. We also develop and deliver programs designed to monitor the occurrence and distribution of invasive species, such as EDMAPS, which I'll run you through a little bit later. And then we also contribute towards surveillance, control, and rapid response of invasive species, such as water soldier here in southern Ontario or Asian carps. So our education and outreach. It's focused to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species to Ontario's waters and woodlands. Uh, these are natural resources which we need to protect. And it also focuses on, primarily on public awareness, and it recognizes the fact that it is key in preventing the introduction and spread of invasive species. After all, the best way to prevent an invasive species is to stop it from getting here in the first place. Once they're here, a lot of the time, it's, it's almost it's nearly impossible to, to uh, eradicate them. Our overall goal is to change public perceptions, attitudes, and most importantly, behaviors. So briefly, I, quickly, I want to go over a few definitions before we began to differentiate between alien species and aquatic invasive species. So alien species are those species that were introduced or are non-native to Ontario. 
So these things are species of plants, animals, and microorganisms introduced by human action outside of their natural path or present distribution. So an example is the Chinook salmon, for example. These things are stocked into the Great Lakes. They're not native here, but they're desired. Uh, they are great for recreational anglers and create an indus industry. So um, they're non-native, but they're desired. Whereas we can contrast this with aquatic invasive species, or AIS. These are fish, animal, and plant species that have been introduced into a new aquatic ecosystem and are having a harmful consequence for the natural resources in the native aquatic ecosystem and or human use of the resource, as well as threats to human health, for example, with the silver carp, which is the one that jumps. Here you see a, a chain pickerel, which is an example of an invasive species. So what are the characteristics that make up a good invader? Well, these are things that were introduced here that have few predators. So they can kind of reproduce and, and kind of thrive without the threat of being preyed upon. They're adaptable, so they can kind of uh, handle warm climate, kind of cooler climate, uh, low food availability or high food availability, et cetera. They reproduce quickly. They thrive in disturbed systems. Uh, actually, moving back to reproduce quickly, you can think of the round goby, for example. Under ideal, uh, um, under ideal habitats, they can actually reproduce two to three times a summer. Um, then invasive species, they also thrive in disturbed systems. So for example, Phragmites, these things that grow along uh, roadways, they're, you know, these things are cut, they're cut down, they're transported all over the place. So, so that's one of those species that can really thrive in disturbed systems. And then, of course, they also outcompete for food and habitat, which is one of the primary concerns with Asian carp. So a brief overview of the Asian carp invasion. So why are they invasive? Well, these are four species, grass, black, silver, and bighead, which all belong to the cypronid family. Uh, each has a specific diet. So grass, as you can imagine, feeds on aquatic vegetation. Black carp feeds on mussels. And silver and bighead carp feed on plankton. And these fish can consume up to 40% of their mass in one day. Each species, under the right circumstances, uh, lays large amounts of eggs in the spring. And there was a flood in the Illinois River. And once the water kind of receded, they found that all the fish that were washed up on shore, uh, the Asian carps actually outnumbered natives nine to one. So you have to really consider the fact what sort of impacts these Asian carps will have if they become established in our Great Lakes. They also have a large ecological footprint. So we're talking about very large fish that take up lots of resources, lots of space, and they're a large size. So if you have thousands and thousands of these things, they're going to be taking up a lot of space. They grow quickly. That's why they are preferred as a marketable food item. So they can grow up to 25 centimeters in the first year, for example. So sure, our native species, our predatory native species, will feed on Asian carp juveniles, but they'll quickly grow to a, to a size where our native fish just can't control the Asian carp populations anymore. They're just too large to consume. They pose threats to our economy, society, and even our health. So just a quick example, silver carp. If you're traveling on a Sunday morning with your family on a, in a fast boat and you have a school of silver carp jumping, it's not going to be uh, a good circumstance. So continuing with the Asian carp overview, so these fish were brought to the United States in the 1960s and 70s. The purpose was based on the carp's diet for aquaculture farms. So as I described before, the grass carp was uh, introduced to control aquatic vegetation. The black carp was uh, introduced to control mussels. And then the silver and the big head were introduced to control plankton levels. But following a natural flood of the Mississippi, Asian carps began migrating north. They were able to escape into the Mississippi River Basin and began migrating north towards the Great Lakes. However, there was an electrical barrier that was installed in the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal in 2002. This was used as a way to prevent the Asian carps from getting into the Great Lakes while also allowing uh, trade and shipment to continue through the, the canal. Now, this is a reminder, and I want to make this very clear. Despite occasional reports of grass carp in the Great Lakes Basin, they are not established in, the, in Canadian waters, nor are the other three Asian carps. So, Asian carp identification. So first we're going to begin with the grass carp. So looking at the image in the top left, we will start from left to right. 
So first thing to notice is its terminal mouth or and pointed snout. So terminal mouth basically means if you were to butt the head of the fish up against a wall, its lower jaw and upper jaw would meet at the exact same point. Um, it has that pointed snout. Uh, its eye placement is very distinct. So it is in the center of its body basically. So if you were to draw a lateral line through the middle of the fish, this eye is under that lateral line. It also has a very distinct scale size. It appears to be cross-hatched, um, and this is one of the, the main distinguishing features that people often notice first in fish when they're uh, calling us to report them. It also has a distinct dorsal fin. Now, what I mean by that is it's distinct when you contrast it with its most common look-alike species, which is the common carp. So the common carp, as we'll see in a few minutes, has a very long dorsal fin, whereas the grass carp has a very narrow dorsal fin. So probably in the, in the realm of, you know, between three and five inches, depending on the size of the fish, obviously. It also has a, a distinct round caudal fin, as you can see, which is key for differentiating this fish from some of the native lookalikes, which we'll get into. It's typically large. The fish that have been found in the Great Lakes have ranged from, you know, anywhere from 8 kilograms to 20 kilograms or 30 kilograms. And these are very large fish that we are finding. And they're very typically a green olive in color. It's not always the best to try to identify a fish based on its color because it can vary depending on time of year, uh, water temperatures, diet, etc. But it is important to note that as you can see in the image, it kind of has a green olive color. So Reviewing the key characteristics to look out for, eye placement, the dorsal fin, length, and that cross-hatched scale pattern. So where have these suckers been found so far? So they have been found in Lake Ontario, they have been found in Lake Erie. Uh, most of these specimens that have been found have been infertile. Um, so they are popping up here and there. There, all, there were also reports uh, from the St. Lawrence this year that were caught by commercial fishermen. So the question is, is, does this mean that grass carp are established in Canadian waters? Well, the answer is no. But if not, then where are these fish coming from? And that's really the question that we're asking ourselves. And that is why we believe that education and outreach is so important. Because it is possible that it could be recreational anglers who like the idea of being able to fish for these things. Or it could be the food industry, people in the food industry. It could be a number of different people. So right now we're really trying to spread that education and awareness to let people know, hey, this will not be a good thing if these fish get here. Moving on to the black carp. This one looks fairly similar to the grass carp in terms of some of its main identifying features. Um, so it has that terminal mouth, just like the grass carp, with that pointed snout. Uh, its eye placement is similar to that of the grass carp. So in the middle of its body along that lateral line. It has a similar scale size and pattern. So again, that cross-hatched pattern. Again, that distinct dorsal fin. Again, I mean that in relation to the common carp. So common carp is long. Black carp is narrow, but fairly tall. It has that round caudal fin, similar to the grass carp. Large size, but narrower body. So the grass carp has a fairly substantial size to it, as you can see in this image, whereas the black carp, it can grow large, as you can see in terms of relating it to a you know, full-grown male, but it has that more sleeker, slimmer body. And in terms of its coloration, it's black to an olive color. So where have these been found? This is from EDMAP, so the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. Um, it's Actual range is larger than what is being shown here, but as you can see, people have reported them from Missouri and Illinois. In terms of the silver carp, this one is quite distinct. It has that upturned protruding mouth, as you can see in both these images here. Its eye placement is the number one thing to look for. So this is a fish who, as some children said at various trade shows, looks like that it's upside down. So most fish have their eye on the top of their head. This is a fish that has its eye below its mouth. So again, if you were to draw that invisible lateral line, its eye is basically below that lateral line. Its scale size is distinct from the other Asian carps because it's much smaller, much smaller scale pattern. And again, distinct dorsal fin when you compare it to 
for example, the common carp. So a common carp has a long dorsal fin. This guy is very narrow. Rounded caudal fin has a deep fork, fairly deep fork here, and a large size and a very deep body. So if you look from here to here, so in this image here, you can see that its body is very deep. And its head is actually fairly large in terms uh, of its proportion to the rest of its body. Has will be key in identifying it versus uh, native lookalikes. Now in terms of its coloration, it's olive on top and quite silver uh, all around. So these are the fish that jump, these are the flying carp. So I've received quite a few reports from people who say they saw a jumping fish. Well, there are many native species that will jump and that's a thing to keep in mind. So it's quite hard to identify a fish that you saw jumping, let's say 50, 100 feet away. You have a split second to see it. So what you really need to see is you need to kind of get up close to the fish, whether you, you know, caught it incidentally or, you know, it's swimming nearby. You need to be able to see those key features. So that very distinct silver pattern, that short dorsal fin, that eye placement, the eye placement is very key here. So its current distribution is, you know, southern United States all the way up to kind of knocking on the door at the Chicago Sanitary Canal. Big head, quite similar to the silver carp in terms of its of its appearance and main characteristics. It has that upturned protruding mouth again. What I mean by protruding is that its lower jaw is actually farther out than its upper jaw. It has that very strange eye placement, which I spoke about with the silver carp. Very low set on the head and below that lateral line. So if you see a carp that has an eye below the lateral line, you know that should be a, a siren for you. It has that similar scale size to the silver carp unlike the grass and black who have the larger crosshatch patterns, these guys are much smaller, much finer. It has that, again, distinct dorsal fin only because it's quite narrow. It's, it's quite small in terms of when you compare it to a common carp, for example, or a big mouth buffalo carp, fish. <laughs> it has that rounded caudal fin uh, with a deep fork, as you can see down here. It has a large size and deep body. These fish, these fish can grow very large. Um, and then another key distinguishing feature is that blotch pattern on its, on its scales, which is unlike that of the silver carp. So key things to look out for. Eye placement, relative size, scale blotchiness, and then the distinct dorsal fin. So this guy has a very similar distribution uh, alongside the silver carp, southern United States, throughout the Mississippi. It's not really represented here, but, uh, but in Illinois, it is knocking on uh, the door to the Great Lakes. So you think that you've encountered an Asian carp in the wild. What are some questions to ask yourself? Well, first one is, what Asian carp do I think I saw? It's, it's really important that you, you kind of put all these pieces together to try to figure out which fish you think you saw. If you saw, you know, an orange colored fish with large scales, but you think it was a big head, well, a big head has very small scales. So it's unlikely that it was a big head. Um, did it have long or narrow dorsal fin? I think this should be actually number one, because most of the time, if you're encountering a fish in the wild, you're probably gonna see it breaking the water, breaking the surface of the water. So the main characteristic that you'll be able to identify is most likely the dorsal fin. If there was a narrow dorsal fin and you think it was a large carp, well, then maybe that's concerning. But if you saw, again, an orange color, large scales, long dorsal fin, well, you've probably encountered a common carp. Was it alone or with others? Now, why is this important? It's important because most of the circumstances that we've encountered so far with finding the grass carp in the Great Lakes, it's only been one, two individuals at most, except for this past summer in Lake Gibson, there was a larger di uh, distribution found. Uh, nine of which out of the 10 were infertile. But if you're finding, for example, if you see a large group of fish jumping, it's unlikely that it's silver carp because the chances of there being that many fish in the Great Lakes in a particular spot is fairly unlikely right now. Did I catch it? Did I snag it? If you're angling and you catch a fish um, conventionally, so it, it bit your lure, you reeled it in, it's almost 99% of the chance not going to be an Asian carp. The reason why is because they have a very distinct diet and most of these fish aren't going to bite on 
your conventional lure or bait? Did it have large or small scales? This is quite important. Um, it's important for us to know as many ID features as humanly possible. So these are some of the things to keep in mind. What color was it? So there are a lot of fish that kind of have similar color patterns. And as I said before, it's not always a good idea to base your judgment on color because of the variability in um, temperature, diet, spawning. A lot of fish change color as they spawn, um, etc. But again, it's just, it just gets you in that routine of thinking about these things and really critically analyzing uh, those few moments that you saw that fish. Where were the eyes placed on the head? This is probably one of the most important but hard questions to answer. Because as I mentioned, most people who see these fish, you know, it, they may see the fish swimming. So it's fairly hard to see the eyes on the, on the fish, but still very important. I think the main thing here would be if you caught a fish and you suspect that's an Asian carp and you see that very strange eye placement, well, then you have a reason to be concerned. Then it have barbels. So common carp, which is the most commonly misidentified fish in terms of Asian carp identification. A common carp have barbels. No Asian carps have barbels. So again, it should just be automatic. If you see a fish, if you catch a fish that you suspect is Asian carp and it has barbels, the likelihood of it actually being an Asian carp is none. How close was I to the fish? Now this is another interesting question. Because as I mentioned, if you see a fish jumping and you think it's a silver carp, well, you need to be quite critical because you need to think to yourself, well, that fish was 100 feet away. There are a lot of native fish that jump. So these are just some of the things to keep in mind as you're going through the whole process. Now we're going to jump into the meat and potatoes of this presentation, Asian carp lookalikes. So the most commonly misidentified fish, the common carp. So what are some of the things that you should be looking out for when trying to differentiate between a grass carp and a common carp? Well, with a grass carp, you have that eye placement, which I mentioned, right in the middle of that lateral line. You have that narrow dorsal fin, which I've mentioned many times, and the absence of barbels, okay? Now, with the common carp, you have the eyes on the top of the head and fairly far back. You have the presence of barbels, and you have this very elongated dorsal fin, which will probably be the main thing that you see if you encounter a fish that you suspect is an Asian carp. Normally, what happens is somebody sees a very large fish, which, you know, is... Uh, unknown to them, they see this large scale pattern and then they, they go and they use the internet and they search for, for fish, invasive fish or fish in general, and they come up with these Asian carp fish and then they see this scale pattern and they immediately think to themselves, yes, that's exactly what I saw. But what they're actually missing out on are some of those key identifying features like the dorsal fin or the eye placement. So it's really good to kind of drive this home with people. A little bit of background on the common carp. It is a non-native species. It was introduced to the Great Lakes in the late 1800s, and it's often misidentified as Asian carp due to its size and similar scale pattern, as I mentioned. The largest caught in Ontario was 39 inches long, with an average length of 14.6 inches long. So these are fairly large fish, and it's, if you don't know much about fish, it's understandable why somebody might think that it's an Asian carp. It's not currently tracked, and this is really important, because I get people who call me, and they may even know that a common carp is a common carp, and they're not, they're not really reporting it as an Asian carp, but they say, well, this thing is invasive. Well, no, it's not. It's non-native, and it's basically naturalized. It's been here for you know, hundreds of years, and we've kind of accepted its, its presence. So mainly, if caught or seen, do not report it. And I'm going to mention this with every species, so excuse me while I do that. It is important that if caught while angling conventionally, there's virtually a 0% chance of it being an Asian carp, unless you snagged the fish. Moving on to the golden shiner. This is another one that we've had quite a few reports of. Uh, now, I put this down here as a reference. So this is a juvenile grass carp. So these fish are fairly small in size as you will see in the next slide. They don't grow quite as large as, the, as these guys, but it's great because anglers are still on the lookout for these Asian carp. And if they catch a fish that they suspect is an Asian carp, they let us know, And even if it's a juvenile. So some of the things that you want to look out for in terms of a golden shiner is that very distinct hump uh, on its back in relation to its head. And as well as the actual size of the head. So its head is relatively small in terms of its overall body size, 
whereas the ground sharp has a fairly large head in terms of its overall body size. Now, the golden shiner will also have a, a kind of a distinct color to it, hence its name, but it also has these, these reddish fins, uh, which contrast with the grass carp and their gray-brown fin. Another thing that you could, you could use is the anal fin is wide with a curved edge, as you can see here, whereas the anal fin is a little bit narrow with a flat edge on the grass carp. And I apologize, you can't really see that on the juvenile here. But another thing that you're going to want to look out for is, let's say you catch a golden shiner and you, you suspect that it's a grass carp. You can see on the grass carp here that it has a very distinct uh, eye size. So it's very large in terms of its actual overall head. Whereas, you know, this is an, a normal looking kind of golden shiner right here. And you'll see that that eye is actually fairly small on its head. So some background on the golden shiner. It is a native member of the minnow family. The largest caught in Ontario was 9.1 inches with an average length of 4 inches. So these are small fish. When handling, this is, this is one of the key identifying features. And this is very practical. When you're handling shiners in general, you'll notice that the scales will just noticeably dislodge. You'll be handling this fish, and you'll just be looking at your hands, and they're just covered in silver. Now, this, this fish feeds primarily on crustaceans and aquatic and terrestrial insects. So it's quite likely that if you're, if you're angling and you're using some small you know, worm or um, minnow, you may, not, you may actually catch one. And again, <laughs> as I'm going to beat to death, if caught while angling, virtually a 0% chance of it being an Asian carp. So what about fall fish? So this is another one that we receive reports of. Um, and if you compare this fish here, this drawing here, with the juvenile grass carp, it actually looks fairly similar in terms of you know, dorsal fin length. Um, eye placement's slightly different, so it has a little bit more of a, a smaller eye farther back on its head whereas this guy has a very large eye. Um, now, small, often concealed barbels, are, they're very hard to actually find on the fish itself, but it is something that you can be you know, cognizant of. Um, one of the other things that I would look out for is the fact that this caudal fin is fairly pointed, whereas the grass carp caudal fin is more rounded. And let's say you're fishing in the spring, you're in a river system, and you catch a fish, and you know, you're like, oh, this, this kind of looks like a grass carp. Well, these guys will have some distinct things going on with them at that time of year. For example, the males, the spawning males will actually have tubercles on their head. So it's, it's these bumps. It's these, you know, growth looking things that look very abnormal. But immediately if you see something like that, you're going to know, oh, this is in a grass cart. So this fish is native. Uh, it's a native minnow to Ontario, and I just want to point out here that it is found in the St. Lawrence and parts of southern Ontario, uh, which isn't really identified here. Um, so it does travel up here, and uh, most of the reports that we've received have been towards the St. Lawrence. The largest caught in Ontario was 18.5 inches, with an average length of 8 inches. So this is a fairly large minnow. It feeds on aquatic and terrestrial insects, crustaceans, and smaller fishes. So Again, going to beat it to death, if you catch a fish, a fall fish, and you can't ID it and you suspect that it's an Asian carp, well, if you caught it, that should be a, you know, a bell right there going off in your head saying, well, I don't think I would be able to actually conventionally catch an Asian carp. Though, that being said, I have heard of various people fishing for grass carp down in the United States, and they use some sort of green streamer to uh, mimic aquatic vegetation which I don't think many people up here would be doing. Moving on, so we're going to compare the grass carp to creek chub. This is another one we've received quite a few reports of. Um, a, a number one distinguishing feature is that there's no dorsal spot on the grass carp or any of the Asian carps. There's no dorsal spot. Whereas with the creek chub, they have this dorsal spot which they'll keep throughout their life. Now, when we talk about this blackish stripe running alongside their body, it is true that they have this as juveniles, but as they grow older, the stripe may actually disappear. And that is why it is important to really look for those, those distinguishing features like that dark spot on the dorsal fin. Besides that, um, the males can also develop tubercles um, when they're spawning. And the eye is, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to see that it's above the mouth, whereas with the grass carp, again, it'll be in line with that mouth. 
So in terms of the creek chub, uh, it can become a top predator in a water body if no other larger fish species are present. So these things are predatory fish. Now the largest creek chub caught in Ontario was roughly a foot long with an average length of about four inches. It feeds on a variety of items including fish, crustaceans, and insects. Again, if you catch it, it's virtually a 0% chance of it being an Asian carp. Moving on to a white sucker. I have received a few, uh, I think one or two reports of these guys as Asian carp. Um, this one is fairly easy to distinguish because I think the first thing you need to look at is, you know, it has a very strange mouth as you can see here. If you see something with this type of mouth, like the common carp for example, it has that kind of sucker mouth, well then you know that none of the Asian carps have that mouth. So immediately you should think to yourself, this is not an Asian carp. So in terms of the eye placement, its eyes are on the top of the head, a little bit farther back. Eyes in the middle of the head, middle of the lateral line, it's grass carp. It has a kind of a narrow dorsal fin, whereas uh, this dorsal fin on the white sucker, it's a little bit flat edged. So it's a flat edged dorsal fin, as you'll see. And um, besides that, as I said, it has that sucker mouth that protrudes uh, downward. And these guys actually become fairly aggressive in the spring, pre-spawn. And the, the males will actually have very, a very bright coloration and actually a dark lateral line, which you can't really see here, but it will appear during spawning. So the white sucker, it is one of the most common and widespread fishes in Ontario. The largest white sucker caught in Ontario was around 23 inches long, with an average length of 16 inches long. It is a bottom feeder that eats a variety of items, including fish eggs, crustaceans, and plants. So, you know, this guy's traveling along the bottom of the lake. It has that sucker mouth. Those are the key things that are really going to stand out if you, if you come in contact with one of these fish. Big mouth buffalo. So, when you compare the big mouth buffalo to the grass carp, you're looking again at that eye placement. So, very distinct eye placement on all four Asian carps, either in line with that lateral line or below the lateral line. Whereas the big mouth buffalo, it has that eye placement on the top of its head. Um, the grass carp has that narrow, rounded dorsal fin. Whereas the big mouth buffalo has that dorsal fin similar to that of the common carp. So it's a wide, sickle shaped dorsal fin, as it says here. Now, another thing that you can kind of use is the fact that the grass carp has these, this curved pattern along its midline. So its lateral line will be a fairly curved. Whereas with the big mouth buffalo, the scales are straight along the midline. So you'll see how it just basically goes straight back like that. Another, another thing to look out for is, again, this distinguishing caudal fin. So it has this pointed caudal fin, whereas the grass carp has this, this rounded caudal fin. So the big mouth buffalo, it is found in Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, Lake Huron, and Lake St. Clair. The largest big mouth buffalo caught in Ontario was 32 inches long with an average of 18 inches. So these are, you know, fairly substantial fish. They're fairly large. But it's also a bottom feeder that eats a variety of items including crustaceans, insects, and un unlike other suckers, it feeds on uh, plankton. Now what's important is that if you catch this, it's virtually a 0% chance of it being an Asian carp. Gizzard shad. Okay, so I've included this image over here which shows to you the three different juvenile fish, so the silver carps on top, gizzard shads in the middle, and the big head carps on bottom. Now you can understand why these fish may easily be confused. So what are some of the things that you need to look out for? Well, one of the main things is this black spot right here behind the gill line. See it right there? That does not appear on your Asian carp. So that's a main thing to look out for. However, this black spot, it may disappear as the fish ages. So if you catch a fairly large um, gizzard shad, that may not actually be present. But you'll be looking for this, this kind of rounded snout, whereas the silver and big head have these pointed snouts. Besides that, with these two fish, the eye uh, is below the middle of the head, so that lateral line again. Whereas with the gizzard shad, the eye is above the middle of the head. And I think the most in important identifying feature in terms of differentiating the gizzard shad from these fish is this whip-like um, fin ray right here. It's hard to see in this image, but they have this very distinct fin ray that comes out here, so which is absent on both of these 
Asian carp, the silver, and the big head. So gizzard shad actually represent a very good food item for larger predatory fish in Ontario. The largest gizzard shad caught in Ontario was 22.4 inches long, with an average length of 19 inches long. They're actually fairly large fish. Uh, it has been observed jumping out of the water. So again, if you encounter you know, 20, 30 fish jumping all at once, and they're around you know, a foot long, it's fairly unlikely that it would be silver carp at this time. However, it's still important to make note of it, let us know, and we will follow up. Young gizzard chads feed on zooplankton, but as they age, they, be, they begin to feed on phytoplankton, so a similar diet to the silver and the big head. And again, if you catch them, there's virtually a 0% chance of it being an Asian carp. So the moon eye. I also included this photo here, just so you can get reference between the silver carp, the big head, and the moon eye. So with the silver carp, Always remember, those eyes are below the lateral line, whereas with the moon eye, this guy has this massive eye that's you know, very distinguishable. It stands out. Not to mention, if you look at the size of the head, the size of the head on silver carp is fairly substantial. It probably makes up about one-fifth of the overall body size. Whereas with the moon eye, it has a very small head. It's you know, probably one-tenth of the overall body size. And as you can see, it has that curved pattern along the midline, whereas the moon eye has a straight scale pattern all the way down. But another important thing to differentiate between the two is if you catch a moon eye, it may actually have teeth on its tongue. So look out for that. So open up its mouth, take a look. It also has a very interesting um, dorsal fin insertion point. So what I mean by that is where the dorsal fin begins on the back. As you can see, it's almost in line with the anal fin. Whereas if you look at the silver carp, it's more so in line with the pelvic fin. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Not to mention, the moon eye almost looks like it's laterally compressed. So what I mean by that is it looks like its head and its tail were almost like smushed together. It has a, quite a deep body. The moon eye actually, they represent a good angling opportunity, especially in the spring. Uh, the largest moon eye caught in Ontario was around 16 inches long, with the average length of 11 inches, so almost a foot long. These guys are observed in large streams in southern Ontario and in large shallow lakes in northern Ontario. They, free, they feed on a variety of food items, including insects, small fish, and crayfishes. And I'm going to beat a dead horse. If you catch one of these, it is virtually 0% you know, chance of it being an Asian carp. So now I'm getting into reporting. How do you report Asian carps? Well, number one, uh, you can actually just call us. We answer the phone every time you call. The Invading Species Hotline is 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday, 1-800-563-7711. Hopefully, you've looked at this at some point, considering it's on every slide. <laughs> but just give us a call. Tell us what you, what you saw. We will ask for photographs. But you know, even if you weren't able to get any photographs, it is still essential that you report to us. Number two, the early detection and distribution mapping system. So you can go to www.edmaps.org slash Ontario to report uh, any invasive species, but in this circumstance, Asian carps. So why use Edmaps? Well, it's a real-time tracking of invasive species. There's local and national distribution maps, as I showed you before with the, the Asian carps distribution. There's electronic early detection reporting tools. So Early detection is key in fighting invasive species that are especially not here. So with the Asian carps, you know, the difference between an established population and a non-established population could be that one phone call, that one EDMAPS report. But besides that, there's also a library of identification and management information. So it's just a great resource all around. There are also over 150 species profiles, including you know, descriptions, habitat, pathways, impacts, pictures, and even external links. So if you're interested in various invasive species, whether they be terrestrial, forest pests, aquatic plants, aquatic animals, you can go here and get additional information. So how to use Edmaps? It's fairly simple. You go to the website down below here, and you make a profile. Then you sign in, and then you can start reporting. 
So when you make a report, some of the things that it's going to ask you for is the species that you're reporting, the date that it was observed, the habitat, the abundance, infestation description, number of individuals, location, so GPS coordinates if possible. You can also use this handy map down here. So you can move it around like Google Map, let's say, and you know, Lake Simcoe, oh, it was in the southwest corner of Lake Simcoe, so right there. And of course, photos. Photos are very important for us to, to properly ID all the species. We just want to ensure that none of the reports that we're submitting into EdMaps and releasing are incorrect. So that is why we require photographs. But if you want to make a report, the only thing that you really need um, that is required is the species, the location, and photos. Most importantly, contact us. Uh, at the OFAH and the Invading Species Awareness Program, we have tons of resources on Asian carps as well as other invasives. Um, if you'd like to give me any comments or feedback on this webinar, please just send me an email to uh, brook underscore schreier at OFAH.org. Or you can call me at 1705-748-6324, and my extension is 227. And if you'd like to report an invasive species, such as the Asian carps, please call the Invading Species Hotline at 1-800-563-7711, or log on to edmaps.org slash Ontario. Great. Thanks, Brooke. That was an amazing uh, overview of how to identify Asian carp and any potential lookalike. Um, so if any of you feel the need to uh, learn more about Asian carp or hear what's going on in um, the states for management of Asian carp and what Canada is doing to prevent them, uh, you can come to the Asian Carp Public Forum in Toronto on Monday, October 3rd. It runs all day. Uh, there's still time to register for it. If you go to www.asiancarp.ca, you'll see it right there on our homepage where you can register for the Asian Carp Public Forum. So uh, if anyone has any questions, they can type them into the question box and I will read them out to Brooke. Let's see if I can open it so that I can read them. And don't forget, you can also email me questions as well if you uh, would like to get into a conversation about it. Um, so the one question that's up there right now is, will the presentation be online? And absolutely. Once we um, are done here, we'll uh, put it up on our website, the asiancarp.ca website. Um, all of our webinars are up there, so if you uh, missed any of our webinars or want to review them, you can go there and check them out. Well, I want to thank everybody who are in attendance for listening. And I'm going to reiterate one more time, if you have any additional questions outside of this uh, allotted time right now, you can contact me at my email or my phone number. Excellent. Well, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. Clearly, you did a wonderful job answering everyone's questions throughout the presentation. I hope so. <laughs> um, so uh, that's it. That's all we have for you guys. Thanks for uh, coming in and listening, and thank you, Brooke, for spending the time to teach us. No problem at all. <laughs>